So good evening, everyone. Uh, wonderful to be here and wonderful to see you all here. It's um, a very special moment right now for humanity. We've just come out of the last, uh, you know, literally few hours from what I would argue being the most important meeting that we've ever held on this planet among world leaders, namely the final, ultimate, high-level climate summit in Paris. I'll come back to why this is so decisive. But we're also coming to the end of what I would argue being the most important year we've ever had as humanity on this beautiful little planet of ours when it comes to agreeing among the world's 200 countries on setting a course towards us as humanity prospering on a sustainable, resilient and stable planet. So this is, can you believe it or not, your kind of parent generation finally stepping up to take responsibility and setting a course which is completely transformative, a new journey where the world which we live in can live in harmony with our planet. And this is something completely new and it's something that I'll be summarizing in this talk in terms of what the elements of that is. Now, I'd like to, however, before doing that, just share with you what is so new and why is the reason in the midst of so much science-based reason to be very, very nervous. And I'll share that with you. I'll be honest with you. There is ample, ample evidence that we as a world is actually cutting off the branch, cutting off the very life support systems on our beautiful only home, planet Earth, that we depend on for our future and that you depend on for your future. So there's all that evidence in place and still there is reason for hope in a way that I have never in my professional life experienced before. In fact, I've been, I'm, I'm old enough to have been around since our thinking on sustainable development started already in the 1980s with the major work that led up to the so-called Rio conference and what all of us, when we talk about sustainable development, was established with the Brundtland Commission that was launched by Gru Holland Brundtland, who is also a, a key member of uh, the B team and uh, the very leadership initiatives that have been pursued across business leaders and thought leaders across the world and parts of something called the Elders which is an initiative that has been very influential, and I come back to that. But, you know, ever since 1992, there's been a growing awareness that we're doing things wrong when it comes to how we relate to our planet, because we're not understanding that we need to collectively work together as humanity on planet Earth. And it's not until 2015, this year, that we're finally, finally seeing that we're turning page and I'll be summarizing this to you in this short science-based talk. But the key issue of Paris is as follows. So, you know, the world has been working for 20-odd years, recognizing that climate change caused by us humans is a growing problem that may threaten our future on this planet. And you're well aware of this, that we emit greenhouse gases when we burn oil, coal and natural gas, when we cut down forests, when we pollute the atmosphere from agriculture, and that all this leads to molecules in the atmosphere that absorb long-wave radiation, heat, emitted from Earth, which has come from the sun and absorbed by the planet, and which actually raises the temperature, which actually risks putting ourselves on a journey that could actually tip over the entire planet into being essentially an uninhabitable place that cannot support the modern world as we know it. Now, this has been recognized, but for 20 years, we've been struggling and struggling and struggling and failing all the time to really come to a point where the world's leaders, where the heads of state, where the governments in the world agree that now is the time to finish this off and transform ourselves to a safe future. And Paris, just the last two weeks, was the final opportunity for humanity to really take a decision that now end is the end and we need to resolve this catastrophic risks we're putting ourselves and future generations, yourselves, into. So this was the decisive moment. 
And it was a decisive moment also because science shows very clearly that we're heading towards such a disastrous future. In fact, can you imagine we're following a pathway that would take us to four degrees Celsius warming by the end of this century. And we have so far raised the temperatures by one degree Celsius. And that doesn't sound a lot, one degree Celsius, is that so much? But I'll be showing you that that is a decisive, incredibly large temperature rise. In fact, since we last left the, the latest ice age, we've only had temperatures varying with plus minus one degree Celsius. And now we're hitting the ceiling of this one degree corridor, and we're on a journey towards four degrees, a place we haven't been for the past four million years. In fact, the last time we had four degrees warming was when we had dinosaurs on planet Earth. So we know that this is a state that cannot support a world with 7.2 billion co-citizens, homo sapiens, human beings on this planet. So we know that we need to bend this curve of emissions very rapidly. In fact, within the next four or five years, in order to have a chance to at least stay under two degrees Celsius warming, which would already pose major problems for humanity. And we as scientists have been putting this forward to world leaders so strongly as we ever can over the past 20 years. And it's been accentuated over the past 10 years through the advancements in science that we need to stay under two degrees Celsius preferably under one and a half degrees Celsius, which I'll be showing the science that I've been leading in particular, that that's the only future for humanity on planet Earth to avoid disasters. And a year back, we were getting signals that forget about all this. It's impossible. You know, countries in the world will not support staying under a planetary boundary for climate change of staying under two degrees Celsius. The US won't back it because they don't want a target that we potentially might not be able to fulfill, and developing countries will not take it because they feel the right to alleviate poverty and therefore burn more coal and oil because that's a cheap way of creating good economic growth. And we felt very depressed as scientists that we were actually about, just a year back, to lose the most important number on this planet, to stay as far as ever away from this dangerous catastrophic ceiling of two degrees Celsius. So we gathered scientists across the world, the best scientists you can think of, and wrote something called the Earth Statement. And the Earth Statement was simply eight points what science tells to the world leaders in Paris on climate change needs to occur, what we need to agree upon, in order to have a safe future for humanity on planet Earth on climate. And as you can imagine, the first point was stay as far below as you ever can from two degrees Celsius. You cannot pass this planetary danger limit, and you need to come as close as you ever can to, uh, to 1.5. And we've put that forward so clearly, and we've had dialogues with business leaders across the world, in particular the World Business Council Sustainable Development and the B-team leaders and, and across the whole world, and what happened in Paris is absolutely fantastic because our heads of state, our political leaders listened. And they listened because never before has science been so clear and so present as in Paris. And never before has innovators, investors, business leaders, majors of cities around the world been so clear and unanimous, unanimously saying, we need a real ambitious decision on climate change. We're not going to accept to transgress the danger point of two degrees Celsius. In fact, we need to come as close as we ever can to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And can you believe it? That's exactly what we decided day before yesterday. We actually took, the world leaders took a decision, which is a major, major step forward, to say as follows, we cannot accept dangerous climate change. We need to stay under 2 degrees Celsius. We should aim at 1.5 degrees Celsius. We're going to peak emissions as quick as possible. We're going to reduce them as quickly as we can based on science. It says literally in that way, up until 2050. And that's after which we will have a stable and resilient planet for humanity. It's not the perfect agreement because the numbers could have been a bit more detailed. We think it could have been a bit more on how to manage ecosystems, and I'll come to that. 
But I can share with you that overall, the sentiment among scientists, I think one can argue among business leaders across the world, among stakeholders in general, we're coming out of Paris feeling that, yes, we have actually turned a page and we're now in a position where we can pull up our sleeves and go to work and start implementing a transformation to a fossil fuel-free world in the future, which actually we should achieve roughly by 2050. Meaning, when you are basically standing on these kind of stages around the world and, and kind of being fully, fully kind of in your adult mode. And that's something, to be honest, which is a shocking point for me, and which makes me so um, humble each time I speak to young generations like yourselves, is this reminder that, you know, we scientists tend to often, I think wrongly, speak of, well, you know, climate change will have impacts the year 2100, and it's 2050, and it's long in the future. And that's a mistake, because it sounds as if this is science fiction. It's kind of something nobody needs to really be responsible for. But I always get reminded, speaking to wonderful people like yourself, that it's not far away. You know, 2100 is, you know, a time when your kids, if you have kids sometimes, will be basically just generally adults. This is just a flip away when it comes to our generational responsibility. So 100 years is nothing. 200 years is nothing. And that is something we need to start really sharing with everyone. And it's about your future, and it's therefore about our responsibility. But the good news is that we really did a major, major step last few weeks. And then finally, before I go through the scientific evidence of, of the challenges we're facing, because I'll give you some of the new scientific insights, I just want to share with you that I will be at least having Christmas break soon and, and being able to say that 2015 has been a remarkable success year for humanity setting the course towards a sustainable future for humanity on planet Earth. Because not only was Paris a success, just three months ago, world leaders, heads of state, met for the second time this year and actually successfully celebrated the new Sustainable Development Goals. And you may have heard of them, the United Nations, 17 new goals for humanity. And it's, if possible, an even more extraordinary success than the Paris Agreement. Now, why is this such a success? Well, it is such a success because it is 17 goals setting out to really have an aspirational, positive, good life for everyone in this world, eradicating poverty, eradicating hunger, securing economic development, gender equity, good education, good health for everyone within planetary boundaries, within what I will be explaining to you, meaning the ceiling within which we need to stay on climate change, on biodiversity, on fresh water, on land, on oceans, so we can have a beautiful, a functioning, and a stable planet. And that has never happened before. I mean, believe me, it has never happened before. This is a huge step forward. And it's again, heads of state, it's not the ministers for the environment, they're important, but it, this is actually the top, top leadership in the world. This is really a big, remarkable change. And then can you believe it, the heads of state met even a bit earlier, once again, on sustainable development, they met in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa, in July, and talked about sharing money to invest in sustainable development. So, this has never happened in humanity ever on this planet, that heads of state have met three times to discuss one thing, namely our relationship to our planet, in Addis, in New York, and in Paris. So, it is like having, you know, Olympic Games three times in one year, because normally heads of state meet perhaps once every fifth year to discuss the environment and development. So believe me, this is a special year. Now, of course, this does not mean that, oof, everything is solved and now we just go downhill. Oh, no, no, no. It means that now we push the on button and we start. But all leaders have a mandate to act as we've never had before. We have a roadmap to act as we've never had before. And the world leaders have felt very clearly that science is settled, business is all on board, and humanity wants change. And that is actually a very important step forward. 
Now, so that's kind of just the, the starting point to give you a sense that, um, in fact, things are changing. So what I'll be doing now is unfortunately take you on a bit of a deep dive to make you understand why are world leaders understanding that we need to change our relationship with planet Earth.